So we should start. Good morning, you all. Uh, this is the BPF on local content, and uh, it's not the first time there is a best practice forum on, the, on these issues. It started in 2014, as you read in, in the document. And uh, uh, it's an initiative which is quite important because it deals with the issues that are crucial and uh, uh, was a concern since the, the WISIS documents in 2005 in strengthening uh, local cultures, or, uh, uh, indigenous languages, and so on, and preserving culture as well. I think this is the, uh, uh, there was a, a BPF in local content in 2014 and 2017, and uh, last year's as well. But I think it's the first time we are trying to emphasize not only the questions of creation, uh, learning about producing content and so on, but also preserving local culture, local cultural assets and uh, heritage, local heritage, the indigenous languages and so on. The question of preservation is quite important and uh, should be emphasized this year. Uh, we have an interesting panel, and the moderator doesn't want to talk much because we have lots of people to speak and not too much time. So I would right away uh, give the floor to our first speaker, which is Elena Perotti. We have, uh, uh, sorry, Elena, just an important thing that we will try to, to have the speakers talk for about five minutes or six minutes each. We'll try to finish in about one hour, the round of speakers, and uh, give them about 10 minutes to interact, uh, ask questions to each other, or comment on their uh, speech, etc. And then we would open the floor to anyone else who would like to speak. So that's the format, simple. But I, I assume that they have read it. Okay. We, we insisted very much. Do, do, do we need to, to do a presentation of the report first, or you have read it? I do, I, 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 can I just go over the main yes. issues mm -hmm. that came out? And maybe the, the list of recommendations. Okay. okay. I'll, I, I, I'll try, but I do, I, we don't necessarily need to look at that. I just wanted to firstly, um, the process of the BPF, um, the ideas that one works intersessionally, as Carlos said. So when we started the work, after we identified this topic of how local content and heritage is threatened or challenged by shifts in political and other forms of, of, of instability, um, we asked for input from the community. And how many of you actually sent some content into the report? That's, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> but actually, overall, we got 36 contributions, and they were very rich contributions. I really, um, I, I supported two BPFs. I also supported the Gender and Access BPF, Best Practice Forum. The content that we received, the input for this particular Best Practice Forum was of a really high quality. So I, will, this, I won't present the report because you, you can read it if you haven't read it yet. I just want to go through the categories of issues that people identified. Um, marginalization of local languages and expression. Um, that came up as a, as a clear issue, but also as an issue which doesn't stand alone. And in some contexts, some communities have to sometimes make choices between more social and economic opportunity and preserving local language and culture. So how social inequality interacts with preserving identity and heritage was, was, came up as, a, as an issue. Next, there was the whole issue of 
documenting culture, traditions, and history, but embedded in everyday life. There are many programs where there are high-tech digitizations of temples, for example, or, or heritage sites. But connecting that form of preservation with people's lived experience in those areas and, 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 and what significance their heritage has for them, that's much more complex than just putting up a high-end 3D you know, visualization of, 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 a, of an ancient structure. Then power and political control clearly is an issue um, in terms of, of um, denying or rewriting history, um, denying people's experiences. But what also was in, what came up is that some people said that digitization in itself has enormous potential, but it can also be a form of selective storytelling, a sel selective you know, we always say those who win the wars tell the stories. Maybe we can now say those with the power to digitize tell the stories. Um, so so that, that, I thought that was a very interesting input. Then the whole notion of irreversible loss and disappearance of documentary heritage, lack of resources for preservation, um, and also in, in the form of digital preservation, there uncertainty. There were, there were contributors who pointed out that today, in terms of available storage technology, paper is still a more enduring um, um, form of preservation than any existing digital means. So maybe it will come, but at the moment, um, optical disks, even high-end sophisticated optical disks, are not likely to, to last as long as the Dead Sea Scrolls did, you know, for example. Um, and then copyright. Copyright capacities, resources, standards. That also came up and the, and the sustainability of issues. Some contributors pointed out that copyright and the protection of copyright can actually help preserve content and, and heritage. And then others pointed out that it's a real barrier. The time and money that has to be spent if a local community is trying to, to, to digitize content of which someone else holds the copyright can actually be inhibitor. So finding ways around you know, the positive aspects of it, but also overcoming the, the limitations. And then the fact that technology is a double-edged sword in the context of this particular conversation. It's a way of keeping local languages alive, um, and digitizing local content, but it also is a way of acculturation, globalization, and, and, and you have to engage both those. And you can't value the one necessarily more than the other, because people's lived experiences uh, are vital. And as one contributor pointed out, you don't want to preserve language in such a way that it actually accelerates the death of it. Sometimes the act of preservation can also be an act of declaring um, that, that a language has died. It's a, it's a dead language, so we have to now preserve it. And, and then hostility and bias amongst those in power. That can actually have a real impact. And power shifts can impact as well on the sustainability. You might have a public administration that's very interested in preserving one particular culture because they feel politically aligned with that particular language or culture. And then you have a shift in political power, and then resources for that, 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 that initiative can disappear. So that's really it. I won't um, dwell on the recommendations. We don't have that many recommendations. And we want the recommendations to come from you. And we don't have to have all our recommendations finalized today. We still have a few more days for you if you want to reflect and send me some, some input um, up to Monday, maybe Tuesday morning. That's fine. But we do need you to think of, as Carlos said, about the future, what we should focus on next year. And I would like us to have a program of work now, as opposed to deciding in August or September. Um, but, but also recommendations to come up in the conversation today would be very helpful. Thanks very yeah. much. <laughs> so, back to you. Thank you very much. So, I am Elena Perotti. I uh, work for the World Association News Media, which gathers all the news media in the world. And, um, and, and I thank you all for inviting me to this uh, local forum. 
the, um, the World Associ Association of News Media, One Infra, profoundly believes that local news has a vital importance in supporting mm. an informed and politically active local citizenry. Uh, undeniably, though, the general challenges of the uh, industry, of the news media that, that the industry has encountered in the digital economy um, have been particularly dire in the case of local newspapers. Because indeed, the constant and steep shrinking of print advertising revenues, the limited access to online advertising, um, in the case of, and uh, the, the fearless competition of tech giants have factually strangled a too relevant number of local news. Local content producers are extremely vulnerable in the face of tech giant cannibalization on their market because for sheer questions of dimension, fatally they have less contractual power and are more pro prone to pressures. So adapting the, to the digital environment has been a great struggle for local news media, but uh, some of them have found their best voice in this occasion. Uh, the success stories among local publishers belong to the members that were able to embark in digital transformations from uh, unidimensional print media into multimedia and multi-platform media, sometimes venturing into new business areas too. Uh, often, what ensured a favorable outcome was a deep knowledge with, uh, of their audience and a capable use of data. And the keywords for successful local publications remain engagement and quality content. So I brought you a couple of examples. In Spain, for example, uh, Barcelona-based newspaper ARA has taken an audience-first approach that ensured encouraging results for its local publication. They had an overall 20% increase in the last couple of years, while the sector in Catalonia was experiencing a 22% fall overall. Um, ARA, which means in Catalan uh, now, is a Catalan daily newspaper that began publication in 2010, coinciding with the Cal Catalan parliamentary elections. And uh, it is the third most read daily newspaper in Catalonia and the most read uh, daily newspaper written exclusively in Catalan language. Uh, Ara's online edition is the most popular newspaper um, website in uh, Catalan language. In general, in 2015, Ara set, set up a metered paywall, and now uh, more than 60% of their income or their revenues come from uh, subscribers and readers. Their strategy, as they say it, is to serve targeted audiences with targeted content. They work on their extremely diverse offering. They include uh, general news, of course, but also a comic newspaper or artists only newspapers and so on. The effect of bringing this um, extremely, uh, ex extremely focused um, interests online is that their audiences uh, feel even more the, the, the situation of being in a community. They really feel that they are a family altogether uh, gathered around these interests. And this mm -hmm. ultimately increases the, the value of being a subscriber and encourages uh, subscriptions. In their online venture, ARA engages in a constant and thorough analysis of their customer and their preferred platforms. And ARA, like many other news media publishers studied by Wanifa, maintains high standards of quality on their print products, which uh, are still what, what, what drives uh, the brand recognition and, uh, and the effects on all, uh, across the whole platform. So as we like to say, digital first and print later and better. Another example that I brought to you comes from India. Uh, India's leading publishing house is called the Jagram Prakashan, and it publishes 12 print, print titles in five languages across 15 states. Uh, this includes Dainik Jagram, which is India's leading Hindi newspaper with more than 73 million readers. Their strategy, as they call it, is a relentless focus on great journalism. So the brand's content credibility, once again, drives their digital presence. The group director, Charles Gupta, specifies that languages will be power powering the growth of digital in uh, India, which is what we already said and we will see in the report. And of course, the mobile devices are the leading point of access for the consumption of online information. Uh, Jagran Prakashan has a great connect with the Hindi language readers, and their flagship brand, Jagran.com, remains amongst the leaders in the category with about 21 million unique users. Uh, print's unique ability to localize and customize along with, uh, with a mass reach uh, is what ensures it maintains durable revenues, while at the same time providing invaluable customer knowledge to be fed into new, pro uh, new products on digital platforms, but also on conventional revenue sources, building on the brand's content credibility and the unique data they have access to. So as an example of new product that they are exploring, the group launched OnlyMyHealth.com, which is a top Indian website in healthcare information industry with 8.6 million 
unique um, users. Uh, and another one is uh, jagranjosh.com, which is one of the fastest growing Indian education sites with over, over 8 million unique visitors. Uh, I close by saying that an, honor, an honorable, uh, honorable mention should finally be reserved to the literacy programs launched in several local, uh, local media. At Wanifa, we have a news literacy network, and we observed that uh, some of the most interesting initiatives um, are being la launched locally. Uh, just like our best practice forum outcome report states, literacy is one of the answers that keep uh, local cultures engaged, and legacy media has an opportunity to, to bring pre-digital natives along with them in the ride towards the crossing of the boundaries between traditional and digital media while at the same time gaining the interest of, uh, of younger audiences. So the key words for us are uh, know your audiences, adapt them online, and try to teach as much as you can the interest of, of your product. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Elena uh, has to leave soon, so uh, I would, uh, before passing to the second speaker, I would ask you if there is any question to her because she might leave and will not be able to participate later. No? So the second is... Sorry. Please, please, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> I have a nasty question for Elena. And is, <laughs> uh, there are programs um, made by big giants, the ones that are disrupting the business model of the local media, uh, to supposed to lo help the local media and usually in in exchange they ask for the data of the newspapers uh, and of the readers mm, what is the mm -hmm. approach of the federation of newspapers on that well that is a very interesting phenomenon and it is true they have um uh, they have been developing programs that uh, supposedly help local media um, I wouldn't know whether in the end they, they steal the data, but I mean, we know them, so it's very likely they actually do that. But what I, what I did offer, uh, what I did notice is that they use their, con they, their um, connection with local media very often for, uh, for lobbying purposes. So particularly in the United States, for example, I saw this happening. Uh, they... Um, they uh, they're facing, of course, the the News Media Alliance, which is the uh, which is a newspaper uh, news media association uh, that gathers all of the national media in uh, in the U.S. Um, in front of Congress for for different for different things and particular antitrust. Uh, they dropped entirely any relation with them and went straight to the local media, to the local news media, which have a different association and which, ha which have been uh, speaking very highly of both Google and Facebook as if they were saving the world. So I think that it is, what I definitely know from first hand is that uh, the tech giants are going local in order to try and, and uh, defend themselves from, um, from, from whatever attacks can come uh, from the policies of the, of the big trade associations. Okay, Tiago from Brazil uh, researches in anthropology and communication. You, if you can, open with a, a brief description. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Well, I have been working with uh, indigenous groups in Brazil for a long time, 15 years. And I would like to present a little bit about my experience with CoolLab, which is a cooperative responsible for installing communications infrastructures across Brazil. Uh, we won last year the Mozilla uh, Award, and we made a public call, and we received more than 50 uh, demands of installing infrastructure, and I have been coordinating installations in the Amazon. We are currently working with uh, three indigenous groups, which are the Ashaninka, the Hunikui, and the Shanenawa in Nakri, West Amazon. And I would like also to address a few points on spectrum access, which I think it's a major issue for our, in our experience. So uh, dealing with co indigenous communities, for you to have an idea, uh, Brazil has more than one million indigenous, uh, one million individuals as in indigenous, uh, self-defined as indigenous. And they speak more than 170 languages, different languages. 
but it's only 10% of the original language that were spoken in 1500 when the Portuguese arrived in Brazil. So to preserve this 10% of language, it's a kind of a huge issue now, but it's very normal, very common to, to, to find indigenous that, spoke, that speaks more than one language, through or three languages, because a man uh, should uh, many times speak the, the language of his father, but also the language of his uh, wife. So it's very, very normal to have indigenous groups uh, that are able to speak through three, five languages. So dealing with this, we are provoking them to use mostly uh, softwares uh, engaged in orality, which means, uh, for example, the free software Audacity is very useful. Has been, it's very uh, light, to, and we can carry this on a pen drive. And to use it uh, as a local uh, network, it's very, very uh, useful. Uh, for illiterate digital people, uh, free software, I think, is the best way to approach technology because it also enables to adapt to very old computers. So free software is more evolved than proprietary software because it can be adapted to different conditions. So this one, this would be one of the first recommendations to really uh, enable people to use free software. Once they don't have any contact with technology, free software would be the best options to introduce. The second recommendation would be to increase the, the, the awareness of uh, orality, how to deal with orality and uh, tools, uh, specific tools to, that are able to enable orality are really nice. For example, uh, we, we deal with uh, a lot of mobiles, but uh, a single mobile like this, which is a 2G mobile, which is very cheap, is able to record voice, is able to uh, receive FM, is able to do Bluetooth, and uh, the camera is not good. But uh, what's the importance of a camera if we are dealing with mostly uh, orality, with mostly speech? And uh, this device costs $10. So it could be really, yeah, we are working with this, we're designing a proper uh, appropriation of this kind of technology, low, low tech technology. And uh, to finish my brief uh, in, uh, intervention, I would like to address the, the issue of accessing spectrum. In local communities in the Amazon, as in many other places, we have a big issue with accessing spectrum because the spectrum is uh, addressed, is assigned for national enterprise. And of course, they don't have uh, much interest in providing local services for you know, just small groups of indigenous. So we are defending in Brazil the idea of free spectrum, which is in one side, the understanding of spectrum as an environmental good which means it's nor private nor public, because in the end, uh, uh, spectrum is uh, locally used. So, and it, it has a lot to do with body also, radiation to understand the impact in human bodies. So it's a different approach to spectrum. In Brazilian constitution, we have the article 225, which deals with uh, environmental goods. And the right of antenna would be really useful to address this problem. On the other hand, we have the principle of complementarity, which means we should really pay attention to the idea of creating a public sphere more balanced, which is uh, we have to have a private sector, private enterprise providing services, we have to have public services, but also have community service. In many countries, specifically in Latin America, following also the ITU recommendation, have divided the spectrum in three equal parts. 32% for private sector, 32% for public, and 34% for community. In Bolivia, they have even split 34% between 17% for indigenous communities and 17% for rural communities, which is the first approach, ethnic approach, to spectrum. So the idea of having uh, free access means that governments have become obsolete in managing spectrum, and we have software that can do it much better. But instead of understanding the whole spectrum as a commons, which is a very difficult approach, if you are talking about uh, dealing with commercial approach and the private sector and public sector, we want to reserve a, a small part of spectrum to allow local communities to enable their, com their communication. This would be my few words. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tiago. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Kim Lee is next. Could you introduce yourself briefly? Yes, of course. Hello, very nice to be here with all of you. My name is Kemli Camacho from Costa Rica, from Cooperativa Sulabatsu, and an APC member also. Um, I, I reviewed the document, and what I wanted to do is uh, some observation to the document based in our experience. Um, <clears throat> for me, uh, something that I really wanted to strengthen is the very a small line between local content and knowledge extractivism. I think we have to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, I remember one experience in my region, Central America, where a beautiful organization uh, developed a beautiful pro participatory proce process, uh, creating a participatory mapping about communities, identifying with all the community different places like uh, rivers, uh, spaces, and uh, uh, resources and many other aspects, yes, as a local content creation, yes. And um, uh, after that, uh, uh, doing a, a website or, I don't know, a technology to present this local content development. Uh, that was nice, that was beautiful, but uh, then later, some uh, years later, we realized the mining company used exactly this mapping, yes, to uh, enter to the community, yes, and it was really a lot of secrets, secrets about the community, the, the village in this, uh, in this map. Then I really think we have to be very careful around the relationship between locking local content development, and knowledge uh, extractivism. Um, uh, some of the, of the things that we think is crucial, and is, there is a need to integrate in the document from our side, is the relationship between local content and uh, local processes, and strengthening the local processes, and strengthening the organization of the communities that are going to, that are developing this local content. For us, there is a need to connect uh, both things, and the process of developing local content have to be really, really in connection with uh, local processes always. Uh, in this sense, we support uh, the proposal of the Waxaka women that are trying to fight for a community property right or a community copyright. Uh, it's something that we are supporting a lot and we think we have to integrate also in our actions the development of a community property right. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that local content is not only indigenous content and it's not only about preserving. I think it's important to develop a local content process and produce local content, for instance, for, for urban communities also, yes, and for, for different uh, communities in general. Um, we, we also work uh, with indigenous women in Costa Rica. From this experience, I just wanted to say that at least for them, they don't like the name preserving, preserving to talk about their knowledge. They prefer to talk about the strengthening. Then this is something that I wanted to also to raise in this conversation. Uh, we also uh, work uh, in developing local content uh, with the Central America girls from 12 to 18 years old um, in the six countries in, in, uh, in the Central America region. We have developed this process to really create local content with them. Um, um, and this local content is produced um, to, with them uh, to talk about the main pro problem they confront. Then we develop local content about, for instance, uh, abandon, about uh, the worries about the land and climate change, about uh, sexual violence and adolescent pregnancy, about suicide, which is a big issue in, in our Central America region, about the lack of opportunities. All this process about uh, creating local content um, is developed with a research process from the young girls, yes, to analyze and, and understand 
uh, their context. Then, then is this, this idea of developing local content uh, or do local content production, but always in relationship with the strengthening of the capacities uh, of the people in the place and the, of the uh, strengthening of the local organization. Uh, this connection be between these two uh, are uh, very important uh, for us. The local content production have to, uh, in, in our case, develop the understanding of the own reality of the people who are developing the local content. Uh, in this sense, we, we have produced the, a new history based in uh, stories of the women uh, uh, created by the young girls in each of the countries. Uh, for the end, to, to, for the for the some recommendation for the document, uh, then first uh, relate uh, local content always with the production of knowledge local processes, content and processes all together. Uh, look uh, for community property rights, fight uh, for the community property rights, and uh, strengthening local organization and local processes, but the production of local content, especially if they are going to be produced with technology or presented uh, with technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kimberly. Is Francisco here? Oh, oh, great. Then it's your turn. Please introduce yourself. Hello, good morning to everyone. I'm Francisco from Paraguay, and I work in uh, the CONATEL, the regulator of telecommunications. And I, I want to say that I'm not an expert on the issue, but I, I have some, some contributions to make. And when in the document, uh, talk about the marginalization of local languages, and I think that in Paraguay we have uh, like I don't know, like 20 plus uh, uh, indigenous languages, but in our constitution uh, there are only two official languages, the Guarani and the Spanish. So we left behind like 20, uh, 20 indigenous languages. Uh, I think that Bolivia, in that in that respect, uh, do, did a, a great job, including uh, all the languages uh, spoken by the, the native and and in the local communities in their their con constitution. But I think that maybe that brings a lot of challenge. And for example, in education, and when you are a child, you cannot learn 20 plus languages. That's impossible. And in the budget, uh, you cannot translate every single document in, in I don't know, <laughs> all the language. That, that, that's impossible. Uh, I think that maybe that c cannot be the way, but uh, you cannot make all languages official. But maybe you, we, we just have to make a specific content, content for a specific places and a specific people. And I think that maybe community networks and community radios and community community televisions make uh, can help to make that possible. And and I think that to make that possible, there has to be an effective, effective and efficient policy and regulation. <laughs> and like uh, the the member of Brazil was talking about the free spectrum that can be a way, could be a way, but I don't know. That that <laughs> that would be that that uh, would be resisted from the the ministry of <laughs> all the ministries. <laughs> uh, but and I think that uh, we we should make uh, an effective and efficient regulation and policy. And in Paraguay, we are in a process of developing a digital agenda. But I think that. Th lacks the the policies to uh, for for making uh, the the local uh, the award for raising the awareness in in local content in the creation of local content uh, but I mean, that's that's all i i have to say for it. thank you thank you francisco next is sorry uh, santiago schuster
Thank you for the invitation. Um, my contribution will be from the side of legal aspect and uh, put on value uh, content in, in the network, following uh, what Kemli has said to us. Um, first, I, I would like to say that if we um, use the, the, the term content um, in a broad sense, uh, probably you can include a huge amount of of uh, items such figures, signs, etc. But if we if you put um, content with uh, culture, uh, you are talking about uh, intellectual works like music, like audiovisual, literary works, etc. And then um, it's important. Uh, of uh, when, when, when you wish to put on value the cultural content, uh, it is a matter of management of the content. And my first contribution in, in, in this sense is to say that you need to add information to the content. In the network, in the digital network, if you don't have information about the content, heritage content, or uh, content uh, uh, that uh, our creators are, are, uh, are producing today, you have nothing. And uh, in that sense, I think it's important to, to have some experience from the uh, intellectual property uh, practices. One of them is to document the works. And uh, the study, the document that we have received, uh, repeatedly refers to the need of documentation of local content for its preservation. It is a real need that we cannot ignore. Um, documenting it does not only mean folding the content. In internet language, it suggests to add information. It is interesting to refer to to the model used by author societies in Latin America and, and in the world. Um, the model is simple, but very useful. First of, of all, each creator, person, artist, has an unique code that identify he, uh, her, as a creator, producer, artist. It must give given to, uh, this is the IP code. IPI code, an identifier at global scale. We don't have that in, 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 in the heritage uh, uh, content, for example. I think it's a need. Uh, each author who enters to a collective management entity receives this unique code, which is used throughout the data network in collective management environment. Then each work also uh, receive uh, the, the, the each work each musical work receive uh, an, uh, an universal code also. It calls this is an ISO standard. This uh, universal code is ISWC code. And then I think if we need to preserve heritage content or content um, made by, uh, by our uh, communities, uh, et ethnic communities today in Latin America, for example, we need to work in that sense. The second example is Latin Autor. Latin Autor is a model of multi-territorial licensing which has the goal to put on value the Latin American repertoire, musical repertoire in the digital network. Latin Autor is a supranational model of licensing for Latin American repertoire based on a similar cultural ident uh, identity. Of course, in, in this uh, repertoire, we include the, the ethnic rooted works uh, because uh, it is open to all the works that are created in, in our region. Latin author, um, uh, in Latin author, there are 16 uh, CMOs in 16 countries. 
uh, is a unique model of multi-territorial licensing process in the world. And uh, it's a one-stop shop that licenses Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, etc. Um, this model had allowed licensing digital uses in Central America also. And it's, uh, it's curious, but in, in Central America, uh, we cannot license, or the authors cannot license to the traditional uh, big users, but they license uh, digital uses. And I think because the time is, is, is it's gone, I think this is my contribution, and I am open to, to give more information about that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Santiago. Next is, let's say, next is, 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 Arturo, Arturo Bregaglio. Thank you, but the speech for Francisco is very good from Paraguay. I prefer other partners. Okay. okay. Uh, Nick. Uh, Short introduction, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name's Nick Bidwell. I live in Namibia. I've been working uh, since 2002 uh, with indigenous groups, starting with in Australia, uh, with Aboriginal people. Then when I moved to South Southern Africa with rural um, people, um, many different, some people who identify as indigenous by UN definitions and some people who identify in as indigenous by local definitions. Um, so I'm going to try and change the tack. And this is a bit of a, a, a relatively new thing for me to start think about because I've been thinking about content and language for a very, very long time. Um, but our world is different now. So I'm thinking beyond content as statically created. Um, I'm thinking about platforms and um, cultures of reasoning that are embedded in machines and embedded in interfaces between humans and machines. So I'm thinking about who does and what does. And I'm going to give two recent examples. We'll start with one that is perhaps a little bit more accessible. So I'm very lucky at the moment to be working with um, the Huansi people in the Kalahari, who are um, some of the oldest living culture that we have. They're, some people know them as, as groups of the sand. And um, I had a the group working with a group of people funded by the APC. Uh, we're looking at um, platforms for, um, if you like, a community network, but without the wireless. We don't have any way to connect to the mobile or connect to Wi-Fi. So working with um, indigenous programmers from around the world and their allies, including Luandro, who works with indigenous people in Brazil, and um, uh, Maori developers, um, and a few people around the panel, around this table, who are also supporting us. We're using a platform called Scuttlebutt, which is an offline social network. And it's an, uh, the, our idea, or what we've just produced as a prototype, um, is um, 40 small villages in the Kalahari are um, sending message to each other um, in this secure, encrypted way, which is basically carrying a whole of a social network on a simple phone. And that is um, importantly encrypted, and importantly, the means of communication from one village to another is embedded in their own way of life. So it's this is the, this is the nitty gritty, if you like. It's not just the what, but it's the how things are communicated. Maybe it's inappropriate for a man to talk to a woman of a certain moiety, a, a bloodline. Maybe it's appropriate um, for uh, uh, sisters to only talk at certain times of the day or the year. Or so there are many ways that we communicate that that convey our culture as well. So that isn't too, that this is fantastically exciting because indigenous groups are working together uh, to solve their own communication problems with their allies. The next bit is a little bit um, more academic. Um, 
and this about um, the algorithms of AI. So mostly these days, um, the big tech companies use neural networks and they use this kind of reasoning which is deeply embedded with certain very extractive ideas and certain inequalities um, between uh, large companies. And you're right, somebody said they're trying, um, you know, Google's localizing uh, its tools. So we've got Google AI in Ghana, but it's universalizing. It's taking these neural network tools which are based on a particular kind of mathematics and a particular way of extracting using huge server, hungry, energy hungry server farms. Um, uh, and certain epistemologies, if you don't mind the academic word. So they need loads of data. Uh, they also, these algorithms are uh, weird. They're racist, they're gendered, they come from a certain uh, way of thinking. But it doesn't have to be that way. So what we're interested in, I have a very small grant with Alan Blackwell in Cambridge University. And we are trying to create programming languages based, um, which are called probabilistic programming languages. And these are that local people themselves, maybe they'll speak them, maybe they will write them, but they are based on their own local concepts of likelihood from their own languages. So the statistics themselves are embedded in local ways of doing statistics of predicting um, rainfall, of predicting um, all sorts of events in the world. So the important thing about this is it's everyday reasoning, as Henriette mentioned in the recommendations. It's everyday ways of speaking about the world. And it's local and specific to those people so the big companies cannot get it. They will not be able to because it is embedded in the local, it's re local reasoning. So, and also local people can use it using their own language forms. So, why well, I would like to sort of shift the um, conversation from and make us aware that we're putting this content out there, but it can be harvested, and not just by people, by huge machines that are using certain ways of manipulating data. And we need more in our arsenal that conveys the history of human intellectual endeavor in the very tools and platforms where we are building. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Bertin Moulier, if you can introduce yourself, please. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'm Bertrand Moulier. Thank you, Carlos. I am going to talk about the perspective of the professional film and television production perspective. Uh, I should start by saying that uh, audiovisual content is a very broad uh, ecosystem. There's space for everything from you know amateur content, tuition videos, all the way to the kind of stuff that I'm preoccupied with every day of the week, which is the livelihood and sustainability of the professional audiovisual production sectors. And I would just premise what I'll say, going back to what you said, uh, the summary of the BPF document, that for us, good preservation and conservation of content, good heritage starts with having buoyancy and sustainability in local production infrastructures so that people can actually make content and make a living out of it. Um, so we believe suddenly the organization that I represent that um, the internet, first of all, the, the boundaries between local and global are pretty porous these days and that is actually a fact driven by what technology has achieved, controversially of course, but nonetheless. And um, and that we believe in fostering a more symbiotic relationship between those who make, create, invent content and the platforms and services that are, have become the supercharged mode of dissemination 
uh, and feeding the cultural conversation. Um, so we're looking for a, a better understanding between the platform services that we deal with in the internet and web kind of universe. Uh, and bearing in mind in particular the very idiosyncratic risk profile of film and television. Now I remind you that every film, to simplify, is a prototype. You cannot standardize the product the way you would with a fridge or an automobile. That because of this, it demands a bespoke business model for every, every single piece of film or television that you're making. And it's uh, also an experiential good, so you can't really tell uh, until it's kind of let out into the public whether it will connect with them and, and fire their imagination or not. And finally, it's got unusually high manufacturing costs amongst all the kind of bevy of creative products. It's, it's probably the one that Cristina Gallego, the producer of uh, Abrazo de la Serpiente, which was a, a scintillating uh, Latin American film made in Colombia, was sharing with us at the 2016 IGF that the average cost for the kind of what she describes as uh, artisanal production that she makes with her husband uh, very successfully is around 750 thousand dollars that's for a Latin American paradigm uh, in Europe it would be around the 2.5 million mark uh, and if you're in Kenya and making a, a soap episode for 4,000 uh, the equivalent of 4,000 dollars that's a lot by the standards of the local audiovisual sector and people struggle to to close their budget on that so we have enormous uh, issues around market failure and difficulty to find sustainable structures to support locally relevant including stuff made in, in the local languages. And we want to, we, our aim is to foster uh, more of a symbiotic relationship with the platforms that carry our content. So they're not, they're not just there at the end of the chain offering a rather meager license fee for what we make, but they actually partner us upstream in the very, very complex and precarious job that content development, sorry, I hate that word, works development, uh, entails. Most people, and I was referencing Cristina Gallego earlier on, she spends on average three years developing the new film with her husband. So they have to have two or three projects going on. During that time, they're not being paid. So this is quite kind of an important kind of foundational things to, to grasp about us. Uh, secondly, I think there are opportunities in some parts of the world for a paradigm jump. Uh, I'm a sort of humble student to what's happening to uh, audiovisual in Africa. We have relationships in various countries there, which are very fruitful and interesting. We're learning a lot. And um, I think there's been historically in many places uh, an absence of what would have been in Europe and, or, or elsewhere, the old legacy value chain, which is made up of a theatrical uh, film infrastructure, uh, cinemas for, for films as the first market, followed by broadcast television, followed by the, the physical package, DVD market, video market, etc. That has not occurred in many countries for structural reasons. Um, there was a, a lack of theatrical infrastructure. The broadcasters, and in particular the public broadcasters, have been either under-budgeted or over-politicized, or sometimes both, and sometimes have had difficulties even understanding the need to respect, for example, the basic uh, intellectual property rights of producers of content. So the VOD uh, universe, the video on demand universe, presents a new opportunity, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of curating and enabling local content. Um, we think that it's interesting also, I was talking about the kind of porous boundaries between local and global. If you look at the rise of some local video on demand platforms like Iroko TV, which got going through a Manchester, Yoruba, uh, <laughs> Manchester based, Yoruba entrepreneur, uh, the business model relied initially on serving uh, the diasporic element in the uh, Nigerian and broadly, more broadly African um, uh, communities based in the United States and the UK, of which of course there are several millions. And from there, they were able to make the business more sustainable and then build an offer more local back to Nigeria and other countries that would be priced and optimized for the local purchasing power. And that's kind of something that's interesting to consider. The third thing I'd say is that the digital switchover, which has been much kind of bandied about in, in the African context uh, in, in particular, there was a big kind of uh, hype about this uh, two or three years ago. 
Um, it's the process, of course, more complex and te technologically onerous uh, than, is, than, than the slogan suggests. In theory, once you have unlimited uh, bandwidth, you can then multiplex content into smaller communities. And the question then arises, who's going to pay for that? Um, you know, um, in, in audiovisual, in terms of what I said earlier on the cost of manufacturing and other factors, even a, a language area like Wolof, uh, which is spoken in, in basically three countries, mostly Senegal, about half of the 10 million Wolof speakers are in Senegal and its diaspora. It's still quite a narrow market to make something sustainable. And when you come down to uh, uh, minority language, like for example, um, um, uh, Jola or Mandinka in this part of uh, Western Africa, then you get to a, a, a dilemma about who is going to cover this, and perhaps it needs to be treated as on the same level as social provisions like healthcare and, uh, and education. And then that sort of incentives that come with it become very important, of course. The last, the, the penultimate thing I'll say is audiovisual strikes me increasingly as I get older in this business as very much like science and the early internet, according to the will of its pioneers, as a utopian structure. I, meaning that we just have to cooperate across nations and across cultures sometimes to make our projects uh, see the light of day. Some of you may have been at the screening we did on Monday night of The Mercy of the Jungle, La Misericorde de la Jungle. Uh, what's striking about Joel is not only that the film was made using a lot of cooperative kind of assets in France, in Belgium, pre-acquisitions pre, uh, of rights by certain international channels, but also that in developing this very, very uh, script that was very close to his bones, I remind you that his father was killed during the, gen the Rwandan genocide. He collaborated online <coughs> with an American screenwriter based in New York, and these guys didn't see each other physically until about five years into their process of joint collaboration. Uh, Tsotsi, the 2005 uh, film, um, a South African film that went around the world, won many prizes, was uh, co-produced between a British uh, producer, a, a local distributor and producer, and an American sales agent that took the risk on advancing uh, the balance of the rights. I could go on like this. We are very much kind of based on, on cooperation. And I'll end with this. I think in order for this utopia <laughs> to live on, if you like. We need a certain, and I get to the recommendation part to my brief intro, we need, uh, we need solid structural incentives, which could be in the form of direct subsidy or, or tax concessions, tax credits, for example. We need, and I th we still think this is the most cost-effective um, incentive, we need a strong copyright framework that applies across the international system so that there's kind of legal security when you're doing, when you're trying to exercise the kind of international cooperation I described. And we, essen very essential, not just good, handsome copyright laws, but the ability for local makers and creators and producers to access this copyright framework so they, they can understand how to turn their hard work and effort into tradable assets that can pay, meet their payroll and enable them to finance the development on the next project. And I also think we need uh, platforms to understand better the importance of respect for our work, and particularly the open platforms to understand that they do share responsibility in preventing the circulation of works that we did not license for their ecosystems, and also to pay us licensing prices that reflect the value of the content we make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bertram. Uh, now is Valencia. Introduce yourself, please. Yes. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, I am Valencia Rusvenikova from the International Federation of Library Associations. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so from the from the library sector's uh, experiences with local content creation, with availability of local content, there are a number of uh, lessons and good practices that uh, are relevant to the questions that uh, the Sears report actually poses. Uh, one of the first uh, questions the report highlighted was who participates. And when we discuss digitization and preservation of cultural heritage, especially cultural heritage at risk, there can be significant costs and requirements in terms of expertise. 
And as a result, one key way forward is to form partnerships between heritage institutions and vulnerable communities, uh, working with them to combine the resources and technical experience of uh, institutions and the knowledge and the priorities, indeed, of the people. And through this, it's possible to make meaningful preservation choices. These choices should be based, for example, on uh, helping communities determine their potential risks uh, that, that you have mentioned uh, before, uh, what they would want to make public and what should not be made public. Given that it's not necessarily possible to preserve everything, decisions need to be mm, taken in a collaborative way. Uh, a good example of such a practice is the Listen, Hear Our Voices project carried out by the Library and Archives Canada. The goal of the project is to digitize analog audio recordings of uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis nation languages, languages that are still at risk of uh, extinction. Uh, and the project is guided by an indigenous advisory circle. Uh, and the approach to digitization is inherently collaborative. Library and Archives Canada offers digitization and training services to indigenous organizations and communities that hold the kind of recordings that contain uh, those languages being spoken and that wish to have them digitized. They choose together what to preserve and how, and the indigenous community members also receive training themselves. Um, this brings us to a second question the report raises, for whom? Who reads uh, or uses what is preserved and made available? Clearly, the first priority is the community itself. To make the materials usable for them, for example, the project I've mentioned earlier, uh, aims to improve and develop tools of access and discovery, uh, such as developing an in, uh, independent web portal or a catalog of existing oral expressions or crowdsourcing, transcription, tagging, and similar tasks. Um, and to make sure that if the community agrees, heritage materials are available for as many people to enjoy as possible. There are also platforms that can help make the digitized heritage discoverable and usable for a wider audience whenever appropriate. In this context, initiatives such as um, online guides and databases, digital finding aids can help, and uh, labels for traditional knowledge content can help build a sense of confidence. Uh, access is also fundamental to another area of heritage digitization where IFLA is currently active, and that is digital unification projects. Uh, these are initiatives to digitize and bring together related content that is scattered across different locations. Such collections can represent a shared heritage of more than one community. So uh, heritage that is shared, for example, due to past trade roads, alliances, or colonial ties. And digitizing uh, this content makes it possible for all parties who may value this heritage to be able to access it online, regardless of distances. So helping researchers or individuals that are simply looking to rediscover over their uh, past. An example of such unification project is the France Poland Digital Library, which saw the National Library of France collaborate with uh, partners in Poland and France to digitize and bring together documents capturing the shared history of France and Poland. Uh, similarly, under the Bibliothèque d'Orient project, the National Library of France cooperates with uh, partners in the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly Egypt, uh, to digitize and build a collection that reflects their uh, shared heritage. There are also, of course, more urgent projects. The Endangered Archives program delivered by the British Library, for example, supports projects that digitize and make available heritage materials around the world that are under various threats, from uh, flooding or fire risks to political threats. We are hoping to see more activities in this area and more support for projects such as these. Uh, and these are just a few examples of libraries leveraging ICT and uh, digitization tools to ensure preservation of and access to cultural heritage. When supported by enabling a uh, copyright regime, uh, as you've pointed out, effective cross-border copyright frameworks and exceptions that facilitate digitization of cultural heritage. And when libraries have access to necessary technologies and equipment, then they, contr they contribute and uh, make unique local content available. Thank you. Thank you, Valencia. Now, Alison, please. Hello, hi, I'm Alison from Hamle, the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media. Our, uh, we're a human rights, uh, human rights organization focused on Palestinian rights. Um, I would say our, uh, we're quite busy often, so we don't have a lot of time to go into the details, unfortunately, of um, 
uh, digitalization and cultural heritage, but definitely these are historic issues for Palestinians. Um, Palestinians from the past 70 years uh, have suffered from a cultural side, you could say. Um, this has included physical violence, uh, assassinations of key uh, artists and leaders, uh, as well as closing of institutions, looting of historic archives, uh, continuation of holding of materials, um, entire the Palestinian entire film collection, cinema collection continuing to be held by Israel without lack of, with lack of access for Palestinians. Um, many, uh, many cases like this. But as today we are focused on how this is translating to the digital space, I will try to also um, address how we see this online these days. Um, one of the key things that we as Hamla have done research on and have talked about is the use of maps to uh, change um, and to further uh, efforts of removing local language and local history. This is particularly apparent in the city of Jerusalem, which Israel has occupied and annexed in an attempt and their attempts to erase Palestinian culture um, from the space. Uh, when it comes to working with tech companies into ensuring that the maps are not representing a narrative of occupation and colonialism, we found it difficult um, to communicate this issue in a way that leads to effective action. Even international law seems to be not enough to convince um, people that certain spaces or companies that certain space um, should have a priority of preservation of the Palestinian narrative. Um, and we see that also in other parts of the world, but particularly in Palestine. Um, we also see um, in algorithms and machine learning that Arabic historical Arabic revolutionary language as well as imagery um, being uh, connected to the lexicon of terrorism. Um, and this can be situations um, which we've seen where automatic translation has led from one language where the word Palestinian was used to another language where it's been translated directly to terrorist or where the word Palestine has been translated to Syria. Um, and um, the lexicon that is connected um, and being designed around a lot of Arab Arabic revolutionary language or even simply the names of UN recognized states <laughs> is, um, is supporting uh, efforts of culture aside in the digital space. Um, let's see. Um, uh, we also have, of course, um, on a local level within the state of Israel, um, where 40, I think, oh, I don't know the exact percentage, but, um, you know, within Israel, you have many Palestinian citizens of Israel, but Israel has made uh, efforts to make it illegal to use um, the name of the Palestinian catastrophe called the Nakba, uh, which was the result of uh, the Israeli colonization and occupation of the space. Um, this has been outlawed in textbooks um, and is one of the words that can be added to the lexicon of things that are illegal to be said. This includes also um, support for we had legal changes that make support for the nonviolent movement for boycott and divestment illegal as well. So we see, and, and there are efforts by um, Israel in at the European legislative level as well as the US legislative level to connect, uh, uh, to expand the definition of anti-Semitism to include any language um, that is critical of Israel. So. This also further suppresses freedom of speech and uh, Palestinian dialogue and discourse about what's happening in the world and has resulted in a lot of content takedowns um, as well as legal um, strategies that are working to shrink both physical and online space for discourse and Palestinian mobilization, um, which often relies on conversations about uh, the heritage. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Well, this ends the round of uh, uh, presentations by the speakers. And uh, we open now for the, an interaction among them. Anyone wants to ask questions or comments? Um, you, sir, please. 
Uh, thank you, Carlos. A very good morning. Uh, I am A. S. M. Bozlur Rahman, uh, CEO of Bangladesh NGOs Network for Radio and Communication, and a policy research fellow of Media, Information, and Entertainment in the of Fourth Industrial Revolution of Bangladesh IGF. I would like to share you regarding the technological challenge regarding the local uh, language in dialect with local uh, areas. We started uh, our battle uh, from a um, couple of years ago regarding creating uh, local content, disseminating uh, local content, as well as preserving local content and utilizing the local content with their local dialect of the, of, in Bangladesh. Uh, we found uh, there are three challenges. One challenge is, is top level domain that is called TLD in line with uh, handling by the ICANN. Second one is root zone level generation rules, LGR. That one also held in by ICANN. Third one is that gentleman already uh, 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 speak regarding the universal code character set, that is Unicode. And then we started our uh, policy advocacy with the ICANN um, for top level domain in Bangla from uh, fourth UNIGF from the Sharm al Sheikh. And finally, uh, uh, now Bangladesh has enjoying dot Bangla top level domain after five to six years battle with the ICANN and as well as other, uh, other authorities. Second challenge is I would like to share you regarding the engage and involve with a stakeholder including government with ICANN, new Brahmi generation panel, they call so called. NBGP in Bangla. As a result, concerned stakeholders, including government of Bangladesh, involved and negotiated for developing the root zone level generation rules, uh, LGR in Bangla. That one also a huge battle uh, with the ICANN. And now Bangla language on the way to incorporate in top level domain and cyberspace. I am sharing you, this is the mainstreaming language in Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladeshi people, uh, most of the people, 99% people speak in Bangla, but uh, what about the dot Sakma, our tribal uh, language, dot Sakma, dot Tiripura? This is the completely missing from the uh, digital cyberspace. So I would be very happy if uh, our panel, if you negotiate with the ICANN and as well as Unicode, so that we can maybe achieve something uh, with the experience from this battle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thiago, uh, Thiago, I want to take advantage of your intervention to ask if you can comment on the following. The Ashanika, which you mentioned you are working with, the Ashanika are, uh, have been cut by colonial powers uh, uh, and they are in Peru and Brazil. When you work with Ashanika, you work with the Ashanika in Brazil or the Ashanika as a whole? Uh, thank you, Carlos. Yes, uh, the Ashanika are the most organized group in Latin America. They are about 100,000 people living the border between Peru and Brazil. And uh, we work with the Pilcha Association, which represents the whole Ashaninka people. So yes, we do work with the Ashaninka in Brazil, trying to connect them through the Andes uh, to connect them with Peru using technologies like mesh networks and digital radio to send photos, for example. Uh, this is a very new technology. We are trying to improve with them. And it's very hard to reach internet there. But uh, we are trying to provide them with a satellite connection and uh, also radio, which is very useful for them because of orality. So there's plenty of spectrum available, and uh, we are mixing different technologies, and as I showed you, also using very low-cost mobiles to record. And also, we are connected with Luandro that uh, Nick mentioned, and we are using Scuttlebutt also to provide them with uh, cryptographed systems, because they are really under threat. So have these cryptographed, uh, because they have already, some leaders have been killed during the last years, because they are monitored. Uh, their land is under threat. They are taking wood and uh, uh, mining and everything. 
and also just to give you the last uh, input on this, there's a lot of nomadic indigenous, non-contact indigenous groups in this area. So to create a communication belt in this area means also to protect the indigenous groups that do not want any contact with the white because they do not want any contact with the white. <laughs> And um, I would like to have this opportunity to address uh, a few uh, a few comments on and uh, on the idea of uh, producing multimedia content. Uh, as I see, the word I see is a word that is changing completely because of digitization. And uh, currently, we have more than 200 million streamings on the internet. <laughs> One single app. Periscope last year was able to enable uh, people to produce a lot of streamings. And this is pushing the mobile industry to uh, push forward the dynamic management of spectrum, which is also pushing forward the idea of migrating analog television to digital television to liberate spectrum. So uh, there's a, an explosion of content production, which makes the very idea of uh, professionalism and amateur very weak, this difference, uh, which also means that we have to address collective interest in, uh, in, in licensing process. So I would like to oppose strongly the idea that copyright would protect the, the, these collective groups in producing their content and uh, address the idea that uh, maybe flexible license, like uh, Creative Commons or other license that can be created through this, uh, by these collectives, <laughs> would be important in terms of defending collective interest. We are talking about uh, the right of accessing culture, the right of accessing education. And uh, the digital world we live in it has shown already that it's not a, only a matter of incentives. Copyright is a kind of obsolete tool to deal with the contemporary digital environment. And uh, I understand the difficulties industry is facing, but it's not because of culture, it's because of technology. <laughs> and if technology is changing, we should really pay attention of the impacts technology can bring to our uh, collective living. Thank you, Tiago. Uh, we have just a, a few, just a bit more than eight minutes. Uh, who should, okay. You didn't speak yet, so. <laughs> think, uh, yes. Uh, so I think we we really uh, this morning we touched upon uh, uh, a number of very delicate policy questions. You know? At least I see two main uh, uh, interests that are partial intention on intention among themselves. One is uh, the preservation of local content and keeping it and or making it available to the public. That's one clear interest. We, we are heard, but at the same time, also what uh, Kemli was mentioning and also uh, Valens referred to the need for safeguarding and protecting uh, collective rights or at least uh, the interests of the communities that are creating those content. And I would like to share with you, uh, with the panel, uh, basically the experience that the World Intellectual Property Organization has in this field where we have governments NGOs coming over from all, uh, after, from all over the world for more than 20 years coming to WIPO to see what to do with the protection of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. In fact, uh, we, through a very delicate uh, uh, and um, complex uh, negotiation, we came across uh, uh, partial solution. On the one hand, we offer technical assistance and training for the communities to be able to digitize and decide what to do with their content. We have a flagship program with the Maasai, with uh, Mongolia, with uh, Alaska, because uh, the interest of the community is not always to make their content freely accessible online. It's often a different interest, is to preserve it, have it digitalized, but then decide who and when and what they can do with it. So I think, uh, uh, and on the policy level, countries of the world would, were not able to decide on ad hoc protection. And we can all agree that copyright perhaps is not the ideal system to protect uh, traditional cultural expressions. That I think it's, uh, it's agreed. That's why there is a specific policy discussion to see 
how to protect traditional cultural expression in a specific way. And regarding alternative licensing, this is a very important point. I believe uh, Creative Commons is a great solution. Open source software is a, um, is a very successful solution in so many fields of uh, the internet uh, ecosystem. In fact, WIPO itself uses largely open source and all the content we produce is released under Creative Commons. And Creative Commons exists and can thrive only because you have copyright rules. And Creative Commons is a way to exercise the rights that you get as a creator. So you create the work and you decide that online it can be shared. The viral effect of open source, it works only because you have the exclusive right. So you say, look, take my work, redo what you want, translate it. But if you want to distribute it, if you create a derivative work, then you should keep the same licensing condition that is free for all. Without copyright, that clause that imposes recreators of it, derivatives work creators, cannot be enforced. So you run the risk without copyright of having big corporation coming to uh, communities, taking their work and do whatever they want without any legal mean to defend the, the, their interests. So, I'm, I'm not advocating for more, I'm advocating for more efficient system. And uh, you are raising a very important point, but it's extremely technical and uh, it's not really black and white. Okay, thanks. We have uh, four minutes. Anyone wants to? So we have, we have Nico Pace and then Carlos Baca and Fatra. And My God, okay. Gentleman over there. You, you have to be very quick because very uh, quick. otherwise I'm afraid not everyone will have a chance. So I think we have just to, the, what I've seen, we've got um, Nico, we've got Carlos, um, we've got Batra wants to respond, and then I think you will have to be the last speaker. Anyone else who wants to contribute something? Let's see your hand now. No, okay. There you are, Carlos. Nico, first. Yeah. Hi. Time is an independent variable, you know. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nicolas Pache. I am from the Association for Progressive Communications, and uh, I, I really, I, I'm really interested on the. Uh, it's 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 interesting that the intellectual property uh, is brought and that the industry is present, and uh, uh, I I believe that. Um, uh, for many years, this discussion has been led led by 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 the industry, and we have the, the it's a pity that most of the uh, elder like the, the oldest productors of content that have been the the cultures that have been for centuries and centuries producing culture uh, are are not that represented here. They they don't have bodies that allow them to be present uh, and. Uh, uh, I, uh, but uh, maybe Carlos, I guess you, you wanted to share something like that, but uh, we work together in Mexico with indigenous communities and in many cases, what the indigenous communities want is to, left, to, to be left alone, like to be, to be led to do what they want to do in their own territory. So uh, together with intellectual properties and the loss of market that we have to run the this space that is competitive, we also need to put a limit on those so communities are, are not governed by the laws of market that are governed in other means, uh, can also explore the, their ways of sharing, uh, growing their culture uh, without us having to uh, impose our rules uh, in their ways of doing things. So uh, a human, uh, a human ri uh, rights-based approach needs to be highlighted in the BPF uh, as part of the process. Thank you, Nico. Carlos, no? Yeah, I want to say really what Nico s said before. But it's, I think it's important to think about the other, uh, another thing that Kemli says that uh, this is very important, the process in which the, the, the contents are creating and uh, how this process engage the community to, uh, to, another, to make another thing. No, it, this is very important. And in our experience, like Nico says, 
and another panelist uh, talk about an experience like that. Uh, not all the communities want to make connected to the internet and share the contents. They, uh, a lot of, of communities want to get access to a certain types of of, uh, of content that they selected, and this is important to make how they can uh, achieve that. But uh, I, I said in, in another panel uh, on Monday that it is important to make the technologies adapt to the community's goals and, and how the community wants to, uh, to do that. So the local content and the experience of local content is a lot of, of work about that uh, in the history, at least, at least in, 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 um, in Latin America, that this is, is what I know, uh, that it is very important to make sustainable process to, for, for that. And this is important to make policies, but also to attend how the, the economic sustainability is not only to make uh, for for money. It's not only money what is important. It's also important to think how the forms in the in the community can uh, give uh, sustainability for that. Okay, and and then that gentleman. Yeah, very we briefly. We have thirty-five chairman. seconds. Yeah, very good. Um, no, I think what what. Uh, Internet and broadband internet in particular has done is it's uh, completely exploded the content ecosystem, and mostly with virtuous uh, potentialities, I think. It means that we have a lot of different stuff now that can travel and engage us in cultural conversations. So we think it would be a bit sterile to demonize one set of incentives like copyright in the name of certain other principles. The market is not in opposition to public interest necessarily. and we think that people should have the choice to professionalize what they do or to not professionalize what they do. And we, we think, you know, a, a Creative Commons is a very interesting model amongst others. It's part of a rich uh, system of, of licensing opportunities, which gives a choice for people to monetize or not monetize, to reserve or not reserve certain rights. And that freedom to us is essential. It would be uh, perhaps... Uh, insulting to suggest that there is no space for different configurations in what's going on at the moment. Hi there, um, Nils Brock speaking. Just a quick comment. Uh, something that I found striking is this difference between uh, the preservation or the strengthening of uh, heritage culture. And I think this is something that we uh, should keep on discussing because it's creating very different agencies. You know, if you talk about preserving something, you're introducing an authority and you are putting under class a living culture uh, somehow. So we should be aware that we are living in a world where uh, the actual capitalist drive is all about uh, collecting stuff as well. So I think it's important to uh, see cultures as living uh, expressions and ecosystems, so preserving them is part of a more complex uh, approach, and that should be part of future discussions as well. Thank you. Okay, we have to finish. Uh, I would just mention that uh, we have the our outcome document. I have, I have a remote participant as well. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, in fact, I can do that both. Sorry to do this, but we have one remote participant. She also contributed, um, Deirdre Williams from the Caribbean. And her point is just that we mustn't forget ephemera and the importance of preservation of, of ephemera as, as, a, as an important component of, of, the, of preserving um, heritage. And she men mentioned the example of an initiative in Northern Ireland, which is collecting leaflets from the, the period of the Troubles. I know that in South Africa we have a, a collection that um, has material posters and other f audio and songs um, from the struggle against apartheid. So thanks to Dee for that. And then as Carlos just said, the, the report is not finished yet. The IGF gives us, and you are all part of this community now, the Best Practice Forum community, we have another few days to finish our report. So please, if you are not on the mailing list, you can write to me. 
um, the email address is on the, the website. And you can get into the mailing list as well. And you can join the mailing list. Yeah. And, and what I'd like you to perhaps say is not just contribute to this year's report, but uh, make suggestions for next year. And maybe this issue of copyright, maybe that is something that we can investigate in more depth, the disadvantages, what works, what doesn't work, how to create new forms, um, and how to prevent existing forms from, um, um, from, from being a barrier. So, but if you have suggestions of work for next year, particularly work that you can contribute to, um, then let us know. We'd like to start the work next year. If, if, should we continue working on local content? So if we're going to continue, we should start early in the year, not late in the year. So thanks a lot. We count on you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And we're passing around a piece of paper with email addresses, just because I, I suspect you are not all going to sign up to the mailing list. But please do. But if you want, leave your email address, and then that way I can follow up with you. Good. I have to tell you that it has been a privilege to have Henriette with us, and the new MAG chair. No? Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs>